Welcome everyone to the ASQ Lean Enterprise Division 2015 webinar series. In our webinar series, we're bringing you the best of the best in the lean industry. This month, our presenter is Michael Bali. Michael is a managing partner of ESG Consultants and has written many books, including The Gold Mine, Lean Manager, and Lead with Respect. So now, Let's join Michael as he presents, Go to the Gimba. Thanks, Paul. Um, first of all, th thanks for inviting me. Uh, a traditional, it probably means I've been doing this for too long. Um, so, so the theme of our seminar, uh, hi to everybody out there, is, is Go to the Gimba. And I think now, I mean, we're 20 years, 25 years down the line with Lean, and everybody kind of agrees with Go to the Gimba. And this is what you always hear in Lean: is, is, is you must go to the Gimba, and this is a, this is the pro, like the prime directive. But but the question here is: go to the Gimba to do what? And I think that these things work better with a story. So I'm going to tell you the story of a service company. This is a uh, this is very glamorous stuff. This is we're talking here about servicing. How do you say it in how how do you say it in in the U.S. Uh, petrol station, gas stations? Uh, gas station. Gas stations. So these guys they service gas stations. They uh, another part of the company I worked with also in Israel builds the gas dispensers and but these guys in, are Italian uh, uh, and they service uh, gas stations. So here it is. You go to the Gimbo, and this is what you see, <laughs> and then say so what do you do? So again, I think we've started on this question. Uh, we're we're at the first poll question, Paul. Uh, it'll take about thirty seconds, and once everyone answers it, then I will come back on and tell you the response. So everybody's working on it right now. So if you want to go ahead and continue on, I'll be back in just a second. And just continue discussion. No, the 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 the, the, the basic question is that. Uh, people tend to assume that going to the Gemba is like uh, managing by walking walking around. That that just the fact of going there makes a difference. Um, the the information people usually don't have is that the worst part of anybody's day, and this is this is from psychological studies, is the time you spend with your boss. So we have to we have to be a bit very a bit careful because. The experience of going to the Gemba might be interesting for the boss when it goes there, but sometimes it's also extremely confusing and stressful for the people there. So to start with, we need to distinguish going to the Gemba, which uh, in Toyota terms will be Genshi Genbutsu, which doesn't actually really mean going to the Gemba. It means like more specifically going and see things from management by walking around where we just uh, go to the place and, and, and actually stress people out. So, Michael, yep. uh, the response for the survey is 39% said multiple times every day, 33% said at least once a day, 14% said once a week, 15% not very often. That's very interesting. Multiple times every day uh, worries me. So, again, I'm not saying we shouldn't be there on the shop floor, but... The going to the Gemba is it, the point I was trying to make is a more formal activity than one thinks. It's not just showing up and and just and looking at it. So I'll try to describe what what this entails in terms of actually what is it we do there. Oh. So the the story of this company is that they're uh, under pressure. They're under pressure because their traditional business is they're a fairly large company in the Italian market and they would sell to the majors, the old companies, the Shells and Total and ISOs and these guys. And the, 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 the market is currently being restructured. So as you can see from their turnover of sales to the large companies, I mean, they, they're really under pressure, they're in trouble. The, 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 the price pressures are tremendous. And many of the oil companies are divesting their uh, interest in, in, the, in the gas stations and, and selling it to lowest bidders. So, so these guys are, are, are suffering. Now, to put it into context, uh, when they go to lean, what is it that is so appealing 
Berlin. And many people see Toyota as an example, or clearly as a model. Um, I see it more as a challenge. I mean, to me, the Toyota, the Toyota, what is astonishing about Toyota is that they didn't grow to be number one in, in a new tech. It's not a, it's not a startup that scaled up. They grew in a saturated market, which is a very mature market that was uh, dominated by, by very serious people. And I really do believe that GM and Ford and Chrysler in the States were very, very serious companies with, uh, with a lot of know-how. And it's been astonishing, astonishing to see Toyota grow in such a locked market. So to my mind, Toyota brings us a challenge. This, it's not so much a model, it's that they challenge us in terms of the way we see companies. And, and this challenge has four dimensions. First, I, I really think they're serious about that benefiting to society. Uh, certainly the Prius, certainly the Mirai, certain things they're doing, and, and certainly the fact that they have the, the, some of the cleanest factories around. Um, there's a genuine intent to benefit society through the products they come up with. The benefit society through customer satisfaction. And again, this is really a challenge. I mean, so many companies, particularly as they grow, uh, start worrying more about internal problems and procedures and processes than, than actually satisfying customers. So the second Toyota challenge is how do we look up from what we do every day and go back to satisfying customers? And the only way to satisfy customers is to have flexible, reactive employees that feel good about their jobs and that they want to spread this around and are ready to work with customers. So, so there's absolutely no way we can satisfy a customer without actually seeking employee fulfillment. And this is the part of the Toyota challenge is how do I align company success with personal fulfillment for the employee? And of course, I need to do this profitably because if I don't do profitably, I won't be doing it at all. So. This is, this is what appealed to the CEO of this company I'm going to tell you about in Italy. Is they, uh, the question I was asked is how do, we, how do we respond to this challenge that is Toyota is presenting us? And here's the big break. I mean, uh, there's a very, very big break and a big change in assumptions when you're starting thinking clean. Uh, most people out there are still not very interested in lean because they have a, their concept of business is that you buy things cheap and you sell them high. It makes sense. I mean, I can't can debate that. Um, this, this, so all they're interested is in contract management. On the one hand, how do I sustain higher prices and how do I get lower costs and lower parts? I'm, I'm sure, Paul, I'm sure in your business you'll relate to that. It makes perfect sense. Uh, the trouble is, that we're now working on saturated markets. We're no longer capturing new markets. All this strategy stuff from the 20th century is gone. Um, all niche are filled. Uh, uh, low cost producers are no longer low cost. I mean, they've developed tremendously. So we're in a completely different situation where it's very hard to buy cheap. It's very hard. You put a lot of pressure for very little gain. And selling high is very difficult because switching costs have never been so low. So if you sell too high and there's not the corresponding value, people just simply abandon you. So there is another strategy, which is what Toyota showed us, is that rather than worrying about selling high and buying cheap, you worry about better quality, more variety, and lower costs every day. So you worry about improving your performance and improving your performance f leads you to find a place in saturated market. So I think, this is, and, and of course, improving performance cannot be done without people. And the, the, the whole concept, the beauty of it, is that we, we achieve goals by developing people. It's not like we develop people incidentally. It's the main method to achieve goals is develop people. So, so the model we have here is that our company success is driven by Improvement of performance of product services to satisfy customers. Improvement of performance of processes. And here I mean very technical processes. I'm not talking about consultancy, uh, organizational processes, or Six Sigma projects, all this stuff. I'm really talking about how do we better machine stuff? How do we use 3D printed? How do we, how do we, how do we improve the performance of our technicity? And of course, 
we do this through people and because the, the, both of these things are done through people so the developing people and this is where lean is is quite unique it has a a, a method and a method is what I'm going to discuss now on the Gimba is a mix of improvement on one hand Kaizen and respecting people's experience and know-how on the other hand and how do you blend these two things so lean and from my perspective is really Kaizen plus respect or respect plus Kaizen and I don't mean respect in a being polite way that that's um, it's better if people be polite but sometimes the discussions are tough and sometimes tempers get heated and you know the, the things get a bit out of hand I mean respect in the sense of really really make it a deep effort to understand what the other person means says and acknowledging that their experience is not to be discounted their intentions are not to be discounted so we take seriously people on the issues that they see themselves uh, am I making sense um, makes perfect sense. So, go, go to the Gemba to do what here? We're not talking about um, we're not talking about managing by walking around. We're talking about a specific management technique that says first we go to the Gemba to understand the business challenges, which is what are the questions we need to answer to succeed. And this is actually very hard because most of us are now in the fog of war. And everything changes so fast. The markets, like this company, the markets change so fast that it's hard to know where we, which levers to press. The second thing is we go to the Gimba to create consensus on which problems to solve. Uh, a lot of the conflict I see in companies are due to people arguing about solutions when they haven't argued on what the problem is. So the, the, at the end, the politically stronger side wins, but the other guys are always dissatisfied because they, it's a solution to a problem they don't have. So the second thing we do is to get people to create some consensus in terms of not on solutions, but on some of the problems we need to solve. Then, of course, you go to the Gimba to support Kaizen, and not just Kaizen in specific places, but Kaizen everywhere, wall-to-wall -wall Kaizen, all teams. And this takes a lot of energy, and this is a specific management thing we need to do. We need to put that energy there to create an environment for people to be expressing their creativity. We go to the Gimba to listen, and respect people's experience and this is very important we engage them in problem-based learning the, the, the idea here is that we don't do problem solving in lean to with the idea that the process would be perfect if we take all the problems away I mean I think this is something that in many people's minds they think that they have this notion that the process could be would only be perfect if only we could take all these problems away that, that is just plain ridiculous when you think about it. Uh, if you take the today's problems away, you'll have tomorrow's problems. No, we, we solve problems like we do in medicine because this is a teaching method. This is a learning method for adults. Adults will not learn formally. They learn by problem-based learning that takes into account their experience. And of course, the fifth part of going to the Gimba is evaluating how fast we're going with the changes we need to go uh, are we solving our problems and do we see people who are taking the leadership for solving these problems and moving the company forward and are these people making better decisions so how, how well are we progressing on the route that we started on so these five elements I'm going to detail them in the in the specific context of that story I will tell you about these Italian guys who are in under pressure real problem and you'll see them immediately look here it is you go to the gimbal and Okay, this is what you see. First, you go to the customer again, but because we need to improve performance from the point of view of the customer, and this is what you see. Then you go back to the factory and you go to your own process again, but this is what you see. So, what is there to understand? It's actually very hard. You, you need to think hard. You need to look beyond what you see and start thinking, what is it that you don't see? What is it that could be different? Where is the ideal? It, it's actually very difficult because nothing looks like, I mean, reality fights back. Everything has a reason it's, and people are not stupid. They don't work badly or poorly. They, they do the best they can. So how do, as leaders, how do we see the challenges at the Gimba? For instance, um, these guys, they realized the industry was, uh, was being restructured and what they were doing mostly with the oil companies was like we're seeing here all contract management so the, the 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 client was essentially a purchasing guy it was a global contract 
and a lot of their decision in terms of maintenance is uh, which kind of contract do we have, what do we owe, what do we don't owe, so we're talking about contract management. And what they discovered is that they, if they wanted to uh, sustain their turnover, they had to shift their focus from these old companies to independent station owners, guys who own one station, a couple of stations, supermarkets, and here it, it's something it's a, realize the challenge is completely different. We're no longer managing huge contracts. We're dealing with individual people who value how quickly you react and how much you care. So suddenly the, the, this creates a completely different business challenge. And if you go back into the process, so that you realize that the parts where you need to be strong are very different. Uh, in contract management, you need to be really good at negotiating the global deal. In, 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 in servicing to independence, you need to be very good at performance in precision, speed, and listening because no two station owners are the same. They have different lifestyles and business models. So do you see the shift? It's, it's a, we, when we see this from the Gemba Sling, we realize we, we have a huge, uh, we need to turn things around in a very specific way, but it's a big shift. Which gets us to the second thing is uh, how are we gonna bring people in the company to agree on these problems? And, and, and again, we're in the fog of war, so this is not so easy. So here again, we have the lean tradition that helps us is the first thing we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at customer complaints. What were the things that people are actually, customers are telling us this is silly. And the other thing, because this is lean, so we have some practice, we're gonna look at um, increasing the, increasing the, um, the inventory turns. It's always a good part, always, when in doubt, Reduce the lead time. You, you can't go wrong. You'll discover you discover things. So basically, the first thing they, they went into looked into customer complaints, and and we hit upon an, a fairly obvious, with hindsight, fair, fairly obvious issue, which is that returning on the station because you have not the right parts of equipment is just plain dumb. And so here we everybody agreed. If you say to people, listen, the first thing we're going to start with is stop sending technicians, and them not being able to do the job and having to come home and return later to the station, first thing, take this away. Everybody agrees on this. It turns out it's not so easy. So it turns out this is a really good problem-solving material because it's not so easy to solve. But if you can see, everybody can agree with this because it's so, so obviously wasteful. The other part that you immediately tackle is whatever, wherever you are in Lean is accelerate the flow of parts and improve delivery to technician, which is blends to the first problem, which is why they end up in the station with the wrong stuff. And so here again, we agree on the problem. The problem is that we need to reduce inventory by not, not by taking inventory away, but accelerating, creating circuits that deliver parts continuously so the right part gets to the right technician faster. And again, Everybody agrees with us. It's a problem we can agree on. It's not an easy problem to solve, but it's a problem. So, problem we can agree on. So, see here we are on the Gemba, and we've already we've decided to start with these two problems that almost everybody can agree on. The people don't necessarily agree on whether it's feasible, how we're going to do it, but it's hard to debate. It's hard to disagree with the problem. Which brings us to the third part, which is support Kaizen. And, and that is, there's a lot here about uh, improving teamwork. Uh, again, uh, the respect part is, we, we I always make the assumption that people are committed, are actually motivated, they do work very hard, but they do have one thing which is to say, just please let me, let me work on my own stuff. Just let me do my job. And if everybody did their job, the company would work. It turns out that's simply not true. You need to know your own stuff, but you also need to be able to work with your colleagues. So the, the, what we seek with the Kaizen here is, is, is not just for people to learn, which is important, which is what we do with the problem solving, which is individual learning, but we need also to support the teamwork that they start working together. And even more importantly, later, they will start working together across boundaries. So here, what we have, you have to, and the second part of, the, of what we said is we need Kaizen wall to wall. We don't need just in one Kaizen here and there. We need to do this across the entire company. 
So the method we use here, and uh, this is a method, if, if you guys are interested, you can check out uh, Isao Kato and Art Smolley's book about Toyota Kaizen. This is a matter I learned from Art Smolley, which is six points. First, we want to see the improvement potential, which is a huge thing because people usually think that all the work is done the way it should be. Um, then we teach people to study, it's self-reflective, study their own method, then come up with new ideas, then plan how they're going to get approval in the organization for these new ideas, who they need to talk to and check, to implement a measure, and then to evaluate the new method. So this is the basic Kaizen methodology we use. It's, it's a PDCA. And here what you have is how uh, every technical center now, because these guys are organized, they have regional centers uh, to surface different regions. And each local regional center has to learn to, to do Kaizen. And, and what you have, you have the name of the guys and you have the Kaizen. And the interesting thing is that not all these topics are the same. This is not one standard Kaizen at first. The point is that whatever topic they take, each regional center takes ownership, championship for one Kaizen. And I think, Paul, we're getting to the second poll question. Okay, Michael, I've actually uh, launched the poll. Uh, while uh, everyone's taking the poll, a um, couple of things. First, please uh, submit any questions that you have, and we'll get those questions answered. I did have one question. Um, I think it was from several slides back when you were talking about buy low, sell high is not necessarily the right way to do it. Um, the question is, I'm in middle management. How do I get my leadership to understand that buy low, sell high is not the way to drive? Okay. Um, this is a question I get a lot, which you won't like my answer. <laughs> I have an answer. You won't <laughs> like it. Um, the answer is you can't. You can't get your management to see anything if you're middle management. If if they had chosen you to be senior management, you'd be senior management. It's, then that's a fight a lot. So you can't. You have to accept that you can't. What you can do, however, is make your boss look good. So when I work with middle managers in larger groups, we really focused on using what we know, which is better quality, more variety, low cost, to, to, to increase the performance. And we don't lecture, we don't explain, but we, we make the next level up look good with that. And when they look good, usually, again, they're not, they're not stupid, they're, they're not silly, they usually are focused on some of the other things. But if, if, you're, if you make them, if, 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 they, if you give them your results and make them look good, they will ask you questions, they will get interested. And and and, not, and 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 often they will start listening, but but you can't explain. You can't tell. I, I've never I've never seen a case where you tell something to a senior manager and say, "Oh my God, you know what? You're right. I haven't seen it." <laughs> what I have seen is a senior manager learning to trust you because you deliver results and you have a way of working it. And and also when they visit the Gimba, this is this is very important. When, when your Gimba looks really good, really good, well 5S, and not 5S for the wrong reasons, but 5S for to get people involved in their own standardized work, uh, they want it. They'd like to have this everywhere. So they're willing to listen. Does that, does that make sense, Paul? Does that, well, I, I, think I know that's it's a, harsh, but... Exactly. I think that's a great answer. In fact, I had someone else actually respond to the question, and he's, uh, he indicated teach them the lowest total cost is the approach to follow. So, good answer. I do have uh, the answer to the poll questions. 25% said that they are excited uh, to show me what they uh, have done in the Gemba. 40% they give me the information I need. 5% they let a supervisor talk for them. 29% they are suspicious about why I am at the Gemba. Yeah, I think that's fairly reasonable. Again, so what we've been saying now, we go to the Gimba, we challenge, we try to figure out what the business issues are. We we say to people, let's agree on problems. And we say, we want Kaizen. My experience is that when that happens, people are not feeling very good here. It's tough. Um, again, uh, what we now know from psychology is that uh, everybody works with two cognitive systems. One is system one, which is immediate reaction. 
The other one is system two, which is when you've thought about it, you reason. But the, 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 the system one is this chimpanzee in all of us. And we have to understand this. We have to understand this is tough for people. So we all have to understand that their immediate reactions, the reactions they have here, right here and now, uh, don't necessarily tell us how they will feel about it two, day, two days later when they've had time to, to, to work through it. But we do have to take into account that this is not an easy moment for people. My experience is they not, really don't, not sure what we're asking because usually we're not looking things at, particularly when they're middle manners, we're looking things at in the broader perspective and they don't see how this, all they see is more work. And the second thing is, uh, in many places, uh, trust is not so high to start with, with management. There are all sorts of deals saying you stay in the management offices and we let us do all stuff. So there's not a lot of trust. So we need to build this trust up, but people are very suspicious. Which brings us to the other side that you do on the game by is you respect people. And respect people, again, it's, it's not so much about being nice is respecting people's autonomy and expertise. So uh, you need to go into the job. It's not a processy thing. It's not an organization chart thing. It's not a value stream mapping thing. It's really getting dirty. You know, I need to, even I, as a, as, a, as a teacher of lean, I'm interested in what, it, what does maintenance involve for, for the gas station? What were we talking about? And you need to get deep, get your hands dirty and get deep into the technical process of it. And the second thing is you need to get deep with the people as well and understand that no two persons are alike and understand that difficulties, barriers, difficulties in people's mind are sometimes real and sometimes imaginary, but whether real or imaginary, people see them as a barrier. And it's your job to bring them to understand, deal with setbacks and go around these barriers, which is not always easy. So here, and we start something we call dojo, is that we listen to the expertise and we train to key activities. We don't take the most difficult activities. For instance, here what you see is one of the most frequent changes they have to do in the maintenance is, is change the, the, the pistol that puts in the, the gas. And we focus on this and this thing because it's done so often. We, we invest in doing it the best we can. So we rehearse and we rehearse and we rehearse and we write standards about these things so everybody understands exactly how this is done. We're not looking at the extreme cases. We figure that people will solve the problems, but we want to make sure that the basics are known to, to, to the point of where it's an art. And the second thing is we, inv the, we engage employees in their own self-development by problem-based training. So again, this is what is the problem, what is the cause, what is the countermeasure, what is the test method, and it, this is not about solving problems. It's good when you solve problems, it's nice, everybody likes success, but this is not what we do, this is the game. We do this to try to get people to restart that learning engine in everybody's minds, to, to engage in their own self-development. And the other, th the, the thing, that the point I want to stress here is that we're talking about adults, we cannot teach adults. We, vocabulary is half a day classroom, that's it. Because in adults, you have to take into account people's expertise and experience. You cannot ignore the experience. So problem-based training, it means that people have room to express their experience and you have to let them go all the way. They have to try on their own and reflect on what happened because this, they can integrate new things in their experience. If you just push them along with a problem, an idea that is not theirs, they will just resist it. And of course, you, you, you want to make them grow and give them more autonomy, which means that you need to give them some space and you need to reward them and recognize them for it. So, so what we see here in this Italian company is that they started having a suggestion of the month program and you see that they have a suggestion method. So the, the suggestion here, first you make a suggestion, then your supervisor helps you to test it that's on the left hand side of the screen, then then if it's tested you need to get everybody else to agree in the group because you're not alone and finally it gets implemented in the, in the, in the company's procedures. So they reward suggestions, they draw suggestions out of people and, and some really extraordinary things happen. Um, 
For instance, what you see on the right is the work of one of the leaders of these technical centers, uh, 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 NICE technical centers. Uh, it's based in Florence, Italy. I'm sure that some of you may have been there or you hear it, it's a dream place. It's, it's a wonderful place. The historical city of Florence is about uh, half an hour away. It's a gorgeous place. And now the guy in charge of this center started looking for these independents that we're trying to look at. He looked at each independent. He made a column where he described the, the independent's lifestyle and he described the value analysis. What can we do to improve the quality of the contract now? And then the next column is say, and what can we do to improve the quality of the contract, the value of the contract we're going to do tomorrow? And, and this was fabulous work. This is extraordinary work because, again, we're in the fog of war. We don't control anything. But we're starting to see this taking, uh, like Toyota would say, we, that they build cars one by one. Here, we're starting to service stations one by one. And we're starting to have this vision of value analysis and value engineering that, that enriches the, the service that we do. As we do this, the decision making gets better and we can see how people grow. So this is what we have here. I mean, this is, this is the key of, of what we do. Is the, we, we are not trying to static, we're not aiming for static optimization in Lean. We want dynamic improvement. We're not aiming for the perfect Gemba at all. The thing where everything is set and everything is work and all the proceed everything is standard and all the procedures. And no, no we're, we're, this is. Please take that idea out of your mind and throw it away. We're looking for something completely different. We're looking for dynamic gains all the time. Lifestyle means we're looking to say to customers, listen, we will take care of this for you. It's not like the rental company that I used to love and now I hate because the moment there was a problem, suddenly they burdened me with, they let me alone and they sent me the bill and, you know, they billed me in one go for an accident I didn't create for 15 days of rental because that's a procedure. No, that's when I needed them. I needed them to help me when I was in trouble, not when everything was well. So here is, this is better customer satisfaction. We will take care of it. And these are the magic words. How often does your company say to their customers, we will take care of this for you in a way that helps you, as opposed to say, sorry, mate, this is our procedures, suck it up. Now the second thing is, how do we improve our standard product service currently in production? What can we do to improve the value? now that fits the lifestyle of the customer. Which brings us to the key thing is the constant innovation, which is which new features and what performance do we need to improve for the next product? Which is, this, and I think this slides to me, represents a, a, a large part of the secret of Toyota's success, is this continual striving for value analysis and value engineering. So here's what happened in the end for these guys. They, um, as you can see, the the old company contracts in value kept. Uh, it's not so much in size; it's really in value. The, the pressure, the cost pressure, was tremendous. But you see the green card, the green curve, which said they've been growing their business with the independent station uh, steadily. And and again, the, this this meant. Can you can you imagine the the scope of the size of this change? So so which they really obtained just on the game map. Other results that were very surprising to us all is that as they did this, their, the way they calculate the margin in the company, it's part of a group, but basically they doubled their contribution margin and they doubled their um, inventory terms. So the, the, this, it, it, it all came together on the game map. Which brings us to your third poll question, Paul, I think. Um, it is, and we um, actually have another question. Paul? Yeah, we have another question, actually. You were um, talking about how difficult it is for people sometimes. Someone asked in um, the book Lean Thinking, uh, I remember that somebody actually didn't come to work out of frustration. They didn't come back. It was part of the, the book, I believe. Um, I guess, can you talk about that a little bit? Is that common for people to get that 
that upset about the change that's happening with Lean? Yes, it is. Um, but I'm, no, well, no, actually, it doesn't happen every day. It's not. What do, it depends what we mean common. But yeah, what tends to happen is that. Um, There's a lot of, I, I don't know you guys in the States how it is, but in the business, what I call the fog of war, it, it, there's a lot, we don't know what's going on. There are these massive changes in technology platform, distribution challenges, these things are real, and they're at the moment incredibly fast, and certainly since the Lehman Brothers disaster uh, has been accelerating and with the internet and everything, so everything changes. Um, and then people try to protect themselves by these changes by hanging on to not looking around the, the ostrich strategy. Just let me do my work as I've always done. Now, also what happens is that there's a lot of operational friction. Uh, so many things don't work. Uh, they should work, but they don't work. Or they don't work the way they should. And this creates a, a lot of frustration. Uh, fr fr this friction, this constant difficulty to get things done. Uh, creates frustration, and particularly creates frustration with people who have careers and are used to get results and are used to be good. So um, sometimes when you when you get people to have to face their issues and have to deal with the friction, it's something usually they've been saying a long time, or or they really don't see another way, and they can get very upset. They usually cool down. I think um, after a while it disappears because one of the benefits of doing lean, and it's not just begin, but it's all the rest of lean, is a lot of this friction goes away uh, as we get things, small things to work and people solve problems and, and, and everything is smoother so we can focus on the big things easier. But at first it's tough. And the other thing is that um, some people get very defensive and very protective. Um, I think that the important thing about this and talk about respect, it's on the one hand not to back down. There's absolutely no reason to back down. If we have an issue, we have an issue, we have to face it. But not hold people's reactions against them. I think that's important. We understand that sometimes we didn't understand something. There's a lot of misunderstanding. People need to let off steam. People sometimes just fly off the handle, and that's perfectly cool. Now, if this happens repeatedly, then we have an issue. But if, if this happened a couple of times, uh, in my experience, sometimes some of the best guys are also the most difficult guys. They're tem temperamental, and they, they will, we, you know, and the tempers rise, and the tone rise, and we'll get into yelling match or whatever. But we're fine then. The next day, it's over. And uh, I have many ex examples where the very first visits uh, are tough. One of the, one of the um, industrial VPs I work with of a very large aeronautics company, the first conversation I had with him, I, I, I was challenging quite uh, strongly on quality, and he, he, he pulled out his newspaper and opened it in front of me just to not to talk to me anymore. And this is a guy now I have an excellent working relationship with, and he's done a tremendous job, but, but it was tough. Yes. So we have to accept that taboo subjects are taboo, and the fact that they're taboo is taboo as well. So when you're addressing the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about, uh, chances are you'll see fireworks. This tends to disappear in in the first couple of years because people get tr you build trust, and people learn that there's no taboo issues. We can talk about stuff, and it's okay. And also that when you're challenging something, you're not challenging the person. The, uh, again, you understand what people do things. That is, Again, people are motivated. They're not idiots. They do things for reasons. What we need to understand is what these reasons are. So, so all of this goes away after a while. Um, great, thanks, Michael. Let's let's talk about the poll results. Uh, Eighteen percent said uh, the purpose of going to the gym is so that I can monitor people. Four percent so I can make monitor my monitor or mentor. Mentor. I'm sorry, mentor. You're right. 4% so I can make my expe expectations clear, 73% so I can learn from the Gemba, and 4% to verify the check step in PDCA. Uh, those are very interesting results, Paul. Um, hmm. It's interesting because in my experience, 
really what I do with CEOs on the Gimba is number two. Uh, the, our first priority is to make expectation clear to everybody. They, they, it's about leadership. They need to understand the challenge we're looking at, which is tough. And we do so by verifying the check step in the PDTA. We check understanding. So, so basically, it's all it, yes, it is all about mentoring people. No debate. But what we're saying is, that it's that the book I wrote, which is lead with respect. It's not respect. It's lead first and then respect. It's lead with respect. So the first thing we do at the Gemba is leadership. Leadership is showing the young people this is the direction of improvement we want. The reason we verify the check step in the PDC is to, is to check whether people got it. Do they understand what we're trying to do? And learning from the Gemba, which is the third, um, is dependent on these two things. If we don't do this, we don't know what we learn. Uh, uh, experience is not necessarily learning. The interesting thing, and uh, I think to me the takeaway um, is this, is that you go to the game, actually I agree to learn, but you learn on, because you ask people a question, then they do Kaizen, so they learn how to do a part of their job better. And when you watch this, suddenly you discover some things you did not expect, so you learn as well. So that there is this continuous learning loop between you as a leader and what people give you. But it makes that you're clear on the challenge and you've asked the right question. So again, there's a technicity with the Gimba. There, there, you don't learn on the Gimba if you just go there open eye just to look. You have to know what you're looking for. And this is where Lean beyond the Gimba is so useful because it has a tradition of the questions to ask. It tells you, um, it tells you what to look at. But exactly, the, the attitude here is that you, you need to look very specifically for their learning to bring back your learning. So the key things to succeed at the game, but for me, is, is one thing that, that I've learned is what, what we call the helicopter. is this constant shift from very detailed problem to very large scale strategic issues. And we're constantly going from the detail to the large vision to the detail to the large vision. And this is the learning mechanism for leaders. Um, the other thing I haven't mentioned here is that visual management is, and I'm not talking about PowerPoints on the walls here, I'm talking about physical visual management, so can, as, as you saw in the, the, the pictures, is essential to actually create a common uh, communication space for people. So, so the large challenges are expressed locally by the visual management. And without that, it's very hard to have meaningful conversations. And the third thing is we have to go to the EMBA to determine, this is a John Shook phrase, to learn to learn. The questions that we're asking ourselves is what do we need to solve now and what do we need to solve tomorrow? And again, this is, this is something far more mysterious than we think. So the, the, we go there to answer these questions. I think the conclusion of this is we go to the Gamba to support Kaizen. And the interesting thing about Kaizen is that on the one hand, we have Kaizen that has results, which grows the business. But the point of Kaizen is not the results. It's the developing people who will do more Kaizen and bring results. So it's really, you get lean when you understand these two things. There's a problem-based learning or Kaizen-based learning that the results are nice, you pocket them, and then you, you give back something to people. The results are nice, this is not what we seek. What you seek is to grow people who will do more Kaizen, because this is how you grow the business. Uh, Michael, we have I a I think that, that's it for me. Okay, we have a, uh, another question here. First, I want to encourage everybody, if you have any other questions, uh, please, um, Enter them into the question box, and we'll get uh, Michael to um, answer those questions. Um, just to, in, a, in a previous slide, someone asked, you had visual management to transmit, transmit challenges locally. Um, the word transmit challenges locally, can you, can you give examples of what you're, what you're referring to there? Um, sure. Uh, let's take one of the most challenging. For instance, one of the key challenges, we will agree that one of the key challenges for any company is to ship on time, to deliver on time to customers. 
well, in, in, in lead with respect, they have a very simple board that we track on a, on a whiteboard, uh, truck departure time, destination truck departure time, uh, where, uh, end of preparation time, where the parts can be found, what the status is, and what the comments are. This is very simple visual management. What we do is visual, physical visual management is we have a truck preparation area. We draw on the, on the floor in a, a place where a couple of hours before the truck leaves, all the parts are there. Simple, right? This transmits locally the global challenge of on-time delivery. Because if we can't have all the parts ready two hours before the tr truck arrives, no chance that we actually uh, will be able to deliver. The other thing is that if we have three hours before all the parts and we realize there's a missing crate, we can rush back into the factory and say, we really need this part. So this gives us a maximum chance to deliver. So this is locally, we have a challenge that fits the business challenge. You would not believe the fights I've had for this whiteboard and this truck preparation area. Some of the logistics people have put themselves into, and this is either you or me, the fights, the fights, the political difficulty to get this very simple board up. Fascinates me. You mean Why the, is it such an issue? You're talking about the fight? It is such an issue. Precisely because on a very local level, suddenly the global issue just blows up on your mind, on your, on your, on your face. You need to deal with it. So does that make, does that illustrate that what I mean is that we have a global OTD challenge and we have to draw it, transmit it in a local way that people understand what they need to do. I, I think that makes sense perfectly. Um, here's another question. How do you overcome people seeing lean uh, or Kaizen as a one-time event versus a key business strategy? Um, executives or people on the, on the, on the, on the shop floor? Uh, I'm assuming both. Uh, I'm not sure, but I would assume probably both. More emphasis in leadership, I think, probably. Uh, again, this this comes from experience with Lean, and I think we, we come from a very tailored background, so the assumption is that there is a standard way to do things, and then we discover a better mousetrap, so there's going to be a better way to do things, and we need to manage the change, and once we've managed that change, we need to stay where we are. Um, one of the fascinating things I've learned from studying Toyota and trying this stuff myself is is that how how much everything changes all the time. So, so it's, I don't know how you convince people. The, the first thing is, are you convinced? And again, you need to demonstrate. And, and, and so, so the thing is that whenever you see a Kaizen, you see, okay, where, where's the next step? It's, it's, you learn the practice of saying, whenever somebody shows me something, it's good, where, next step, where do you go from there? And, but, but again, I think the, the key slide here is this one. This, this is pretty deep in terms of we're not, Organizations of the 20th century, uh, the quality function, for instance, is very clear, that, are created to optimize in a static way because they think that if everything's optimized, everything's going to run fine and we make money. That's just simply not true anymore. We make money if we dynamize and always look for gains, dynamic gains. We change things and we bring people with us in that movement. And this is where we make money because the environment is not stable, because everything changes all the time. So, so I think that the, 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 it's the other way around. First, you need to convince yourself that it's a continuous Kaizen. And when people see that it actually makes more money, they will listen to you. Um, how does one go to the Gemba for a large global company, um, specifically like a software company that's all across the world? How do you, how do you go to the Gemba? Hmm. Well, take a lot of planes. Um, I, I write the books from my father. He taught me a lot of this stuff. He was a pioneer of lean here. In France, he was a CEO of an automotive company, and he, he had Toyota as a client, and he had about 50-something 50, 50 plants around the world. And um, on average, he would uh, visit uh, one a week. He would not actually visit one a week. You mean sometimes when he'd go to North America, he'd, he'd spend a week seeing a plant a day or something like that. But but on average, he would visit one a week. So yeah, he spent a lot of time traveling. Um, 
we need to understand. I, 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 there's a lot of discussion in the IT community about can we do virtual Gimba, which is can we use the IT tools, the, the visual, like we're doing now with a webinar. Um, sure we can. Of course we can. We can um, certainly share code again around a screen. But uh, the, the, the science of it is that um, information gets transmitted virtually, digitally, but trust needs face-to-face. -face. And I, as you've heard from my talk, mutual trust is a huge part of the equation. It's something we are growing through going to the game. But, so uh, there's no way around it. Face-to-face, -face, you need to go there. Usually leaders are too busy with the big picture. They seem to have no time for seeing business challenges. How do you inspire leadership to go to the Gemba? Uh, again, it's one of these things where I, I don't know. I don't know. The, the, the people I work with, I'm very lucky, are the people who want to go to the Gemba and don't know how to do it, so they come to me. But I don't know. That's definitely a tough question. <laughs> Um, there was one comment here. Shouldn't the executive leadership be also thinking about what we need to solve tomorrow? Not sure where the question yeah, came uh, from. This is, I mean, this is what we. That, this is what keeps us up at night. The question is, how do we know we're right? And this is where Lean is so interesting. I mean, I was doing this just this week. Uh, yesterday, we were. We we have. Um, I think I tweeted it. We had a. We have a. Excel sheet where we have the challenges of the company and that we think that are the challenges of the company at the CEO level and then we have the who is doing what Kaizen on this and this is where Lean is scientific is we don't actually rely just on the CEO vision but we check through the Kaizens whether this these are the right challenges. Uh, this is tough. But it's fascinating. It's fascinating. So, so, so we make hypotheses on the, what the challenges are. We ask people to make Kaizen exercises to develop them, but also to test in an empirical way whether these are real challenges or red herrings. And uh, and it's never it's it's never never done. You you have to see yourself as and it's a it's a third expression as a green tomato. You you have to see yourself as a, unfinished and incomplete because it's never done. It, it, something else always happens. Hey, it looks like we have two, two questions remaining, Michael. Um, I have been studying the improvement kata uh, via Mike Rother. Is this instrument for Kaizen at the local level? Is, is this the instrument for Kaizen at the local level? And what other oh. methods are there? Well, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. To it. I mean, there are very different traditions uh, of doing PDCA. It's all about PDCA. Toyota Kava is a very powerful way of doing PDCA. And at local level, um, Toyota Kata has uh, does grab something in people's attention. I have to say, absolutely. Uh, the the many of the discussions I have with Mike is that I'm, I, as I understand what he tells me is that as you do to as you do the Kata. You, you discover um, what the target conditions are. I'm not so sure about this. Again, in, in my own practice, uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion of what the challenges are and what we're looking, what, what we're going after, and, and there's a lot of stuff in the lean tradition. But certainly, um, Canada is great at uh, local level. I'm not sure, again, as, as I showed in, your pres in the presentation, um, I'm not sure where that gets you if you don't link it with the leadership challenges. Okay. Um, last question. I agree. Uh, uh, trust, just actually just a second here. I got, got mixed up. How do we address reward and recognition as part of lean strategy? Sometimes just respect is not enough. I think that this. I, I honestly, I don't have a. I don't have a set opinion on this. I think again, um, every company has their history, their practices. I'm certainly a big believer in uh, profit sharing, of course. Um, but let's let let's think about it this way. They, to me, the, again, this uh, recognition, the the actual phys the reward system 
is what it is. It's like the like what we're saying about buy buy cheap and sell expensive, and all these things are pretty set. And I'd be very cautious in changing uh, these because these changes for people are very very disturbing. So I say, okay, there is there. We can change it. We should certainly improve it um, if if somebody thinks of something better. But I would really focus on recognizing through active respect and uh, recognize the. the there's no such thing as listening. There's are, there are only proofs of listening. And the only time you prove that you've listened to somebody when you say, you know what, Maggie, Joe, what you said, let's do it. That's the only moment. That's the only moment that matters for somebody that proves that you've listened. Is that when you don't own your their idea, when you don't rephrase, when you don't say, I'll think about it, but when you say, you know, Susie, peel. Go for it. And this is something that as a leader is very hard to learn. And you learn. But this is the proof of listening. And you make people's day when you do this. That they've succeeded adding value be beyond just doing their work, but that the company is going to have something of theirs that they suggested. So of course, this is where I show the system of the suggestions. In order to be able to do this and not be silly, you've prepared the ground, you've built it up, and you, you have to develop your middle managers so they do this. But this is the only proof of listening. So when you say to somebody, you know, Paul, this idea, just let's do it. Uh, great, uh, great comment there. Um, one last one, really quick. How do we use Kaizen to build trust? All right, this is a complex one. Sorry, do I have five minutes? Uh, I need to get into it. Actually, more like maybe one or two. How's that? You uh, give well, us a short. <laughs> the first thing is you need to show people the direction you want in their work. This is just, you know, really uh, Lean redefines job as jo a job is work plus Kaizen. So first you need to respect their work, to understand their work. Secondly, you need problem. You use problem-based learning to engage people in their own self-development, their own technicity. That by solving problems, they learn to do their work better. And then you use Kaizen in the method I showed to intensify the collaboration, to engage them with their teamwork, but also with people across boundaries. So basically, you use problem-solving or improvement reaching as a team together beyond boundaries. And as you do this repeatedly, people learn to understand each other's perspective and they're, they're on the front line together, which builds trust. And out of this, you, you emerge with some leadership that comes up like, like this guy in Florence with systems that will affect the entire company. And when you got that, you've got something absolute magic. When somebody is contributing a system that will change the course of the company or, or technical innovation or something. But you build this up. So you you use Kaizen to develop trust because people within the Kaizen context face a common issue together from different perspective and 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 they learn to to find a different way of doing things and doing it together. And they also, very importantly, learn to sell it to the rest of the organization. And if you get that right, um, a lot of misunderstandings just disappear with time, but it takes time. It takes time. Um, that's great, Michael. Um, I just want to take a second first and thank you, Michael, for uh, uh, doing this webinar with us today. Would, would Do you have any final comments you would like to make before we leave? Um, hey, uh, Gemba is a great teacher. I am Paul Harbat, the 2015 Chair of the ASQ Lean Enterprise Division Webinar Series. Thank you, Michael, for presenting. Go to the Gemba, and thank you for taking your valuable time to listen. If you have any questions about the content of this webinar, feel free to contact Michael directly. Next month, our presenter will be David Mann from David Mann Consultants, who will be presenting a Leader Standard Work Webinar. What, when, for whom, and why? Leader standard work is the essential element in a lean management system. 
It's the element in the system that closes the loop on process focus and keeps it closed. Process focus sustains lean applications and captures previously unrecognized problems, opportunities for extending lean gains and bringing continuous improvement to life. Lean production and lean management form a lean ecosystem, which when healthy, makes a better day at work for leaders and frontline workers as well by eliminating frustrating delays for workers and the endless firefighting for leaders. David Mann is the principal of David Mann Lean Consulting. In 15 years of experience at Steelcase Incorporated, Mann developed and applied the concepts of the lean management system. Supporting 40 plus lean manufacturing value stream transformations and then leading an internal team that completed over 100 successful lean conversions in administrative and transactional value streams. David Shingo Prize winning book, Creating a Lean Culture Tools to Sustain Lean Conversions, has been translated into Portuguese, Chinese, Russian, Polish, Spanish, and Thai. The third edition was released in October 2014. Over 100,000 copies of this field bestseller are in print. The ASQ Lean Enterprise Division webinar series is the place for you to hear the best of the best in the lean industry and learn more about how to apply lean in your application. The American Society of Quality Lean Enterprise Division is a global network of professionals helping individuals and organizations apply proven and leading-edge lean principles and practices to achieve dramatic results in your personal and organizational success. Come lean with us. Thank you for listening, and let's listen together next month.